Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this very special program. My name is Tony Coffey, and I'm a graduate of the class of 56 and a member of the AABC Reunion Committee. As a quick reminder, this online event enables an attendee to participate through a personal device's microphone and or camera. An attendee may elect not to participate through use of a microphone and or camera. The election of an attendee to use a microphone and or camera constitutes a release and waiver of rights in the capture of the attendee's image, likeness and or voice for the exclusive use by Barnard College. We have very special guests with us today, Provost Linda Bell and Professor Bob McCahey. Linda Bell is the Provost and Dean of the Faculty at Barnard, where she is also the Claire Tao Professor of Economics. She joined the Barnard community in 2012. Previous to joining Barnard, Professor Bell was the Provost and John B. Hereford Professor of Economics at Haverford College. In her very professional and scholarly capacity, she has served as a consultant to the World Bank and the US Department of Labor, as well as held visiting faculty appointments at the Woodrow Wilson School at Princeton University, the John F. Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University and at Stanford University. Provost Bell is an empirical econom economist specializing in labor markets and public policy and she has written and lectured extensively on the topics of compensation, union concessions, and hours of work in the US and Europe. Her recent research focuses on the determination of gender compensation differences in executive pay at large US corporations generally, and on female mentorship at the executive level specifically. Please join me in welcoming Provost Bell. Thank you. Thank you, Tony, very much for that lovely introduction. And welcome everybody to this event. I truly look forward to, um, to probing with, uh, with Professor McKehy, the treasure trove of information in his wonderful book, A College of Her Own, The History of Barnard. Um, but, and, but before we do that, let me uh, allow, allow myself please to introduce the author, uh, Professor Bob McKehy. Bob McKay, he has taught American history at Barnard for 51 years until his recent retirement in 2020. He has twice been chair of the history department and was dean of the faculty from 1987 to 1993. Professor McKay was the founding director of the still ongoing and very vibrant first year seminar series and taught in the program for 30 years. His teaching specialties are the social history of American intellectual communities, higher education, and early maritime history. He's the author of seven books, the last three and the one in progress dealing with aspects of Columbia's and Barnard's history. He's a graduate of the University of Rochester, the University of North Carolina, and Harvard University. Bob has served for four years as an officer in the United States Navy. And his daughter, Hannah, as if his credentials and attachment to Barnard were not enough, is a graduate of the class of 1989. So welcome, Bob. Thank you for having me. And thank you, Linda, for a very nice introduction. <laughs> You're welcome, Bob. <clears throat> to, to, to kick things off, Bob, <clears throat> excuse me, I've lost my voice. Um, will you share with us what inspired you to write this, this beautiful book, by the way. I really enjoyed it. I learned a lot and I have a lot of questions for you. Okay, well, um, <laughs> all those scores I gladly will respond. Um, writing books about uh, academic institutions has become almost by default the thing I do. Um, I didn't start out that way. Uh, although I had, I think from very early on, a fascination with academic institutions. Uh, I grew up just outside of Providence, Rhode Island. Uh, and then one would say, well, you must know Brown intimately. Um, I knew it to the extent that you could easily get over the football field fences on a Saturday afternoon and risk hardly any recrimination at all for sitting in the empty seats up there. 
uh, fraternity houses on Saturday night were equally open to 17 year olds who could fake it. Uh, so I, at one level, I was quite intimate with it. And yet I also realized that I knew not a single person who had any academic connection to Brown University living 10 miles away from it. Uh, all the academic connections I knew of, a result probably of going to a Catholic high school, were with Providence College, Boston College, Holy Cross. If a kid was to take something of a reach, it would be Georgetown. Uh, but no, not in generational terms either. Uh, so th that kind of institution really intrigued me. And for better or worse, I didn't end up at Providence College at the University of Rhode Island, but the Navy sent me to the University of Rochester uh, in upstate New York, which turned out to be a terrific place to be in the late 50s, early 60s. Uh, and then I had exposure in the Navy to the University of North Carolina, University of California, University of Georgia and Athens, uh, and then to Harvard, uh, and then to Barnard slash Columbia, all intriguing places. Uh, so finding myself needing to develop a specialty and not paying very good attention to <laughs> market considerations, because academic history is, is, let us call it a sideline, a small activity, um, but it's one that I enjoyed and I always felt I could have at least a modest local audience for what I was, what I was writing. Uh, the fact that it led me to one of the more interesting jobs I've had in my life, the job you now have, Linda, um, also, I think, was a, uh, a considerable benefit. If the fact of the matter is that Joanne Kwan, who was communications director back at the time Barnard was having its 125th anniversary, asked me, would I be interested in writing a history of Barnard uh, because it was going to be a full six months before the celebration? <laughs> I passed on that notion, but returned to it later with, with your help and, and that of CNs. So that's how it came to be. Great. Well, we're all benefactors of that, Bob, I have to say. So um, I just want to remind uh, those of those participating today that you are welcome to put questions in the Q&A. Um, just it's a button on the bottom of your Zoom screen, so it's Q&A. You can put some questions in there and they'll get fed to me. And that way you can have your questions asked, answered by Professor McKay. So Bob, um, if you could elaborate for me a little bit, since it's founding, if I asked you what's, give me three to five things that are extraordinarily different at Barnard today, and then give me some things that have endured, what would you point to? Okay, uh, a difference, well, obviously size in the, in the size of the student body and faculty, although, Correspondingly, not much difference in space. So, <laughs> so, we still are pretty much crowded into the three and a half, four acres that we that Barnett had as early as 1903 or so, with some outliers over there in Plimpton and down by 110th Street. So it's it is it's remained an intensely urban environment. Um, that hasn't that hasn't changed at at, at all. Uh, it, the, in, in some ways, the, the student party has come almost full circle. Uh, students who went to Barnard in the 1890s and into the early 1900s came from a, a largely came from old New York. Uh, some of the families that go back and could list themselves as Knickerbockers as, uh, part of the Anglican establishment, if you will. Um, and then that changed um, as those uh, daughters of wealthy families found in many ways going away to school, getting out of New York was the, was the favorite way. And had they gone to finishing schools before that or uh, college prep schools, that another further encouragement to 
stay with your classmates and go to Wellesley, to Bryn Mawr, to Smith. Um, and Barnard then uh, developed almost without um, thinking about it, or when they did think about it with some misgivings, uh, developed a student clientele that came largely from New York City and not from the upper crust, uh, but from what one trustee called the aspiring masses, um, second generation immigrant kids, um, kids who were prepared uh, academically in the public high schools, um, lots of Jewish kids, lots of Catholic kids. Um, Barnard was probably the first American undergraduate school where Protestants came to be in the minority. I mean, other than religiously based schools. Um, and they, so that was Barnard for, for, I think, the better part of, its, of this century. And now, it, insofar as it draws less from New York City, uh, more nationally, and I think the student body, because it's so competitive at the admissions level, is also uh, comparatively well healed, um, which distinguishes it, I think, to some degree from uh, the student body, certainly in the 1930s, but even in the late 1960s when I came. I think of a couple of instances of well, folks who have remained connected with the Barnard community. Um, Dorothy Denbury, uh, class of what I think 1971, uh, describes the options she had as a 16 year old growing up in, in Brooklyn. It was Brooklyn College or Queens or Barnard. Um, and Barnard was a reach. Uh, and she probably wouldn't have known about Barnard, but for the fact that in the 1930s, Barnard graduates went into public high school teaching as jobs that were available. And uh, one of them spotted Dorothy and said, give Barnard a chance. Uh, so those are, those, I think those are the main differences. Uh, trustees remain, um, well, they, right from the get-go, which was unusual about Barnard, uh, were at least par women had parity on the board and soon came into a majority. That remains the case today. Uh, far fewer of the women today, uh, or far, put it more positively, most of the women today have also had professional careers, which again wasn't the norm. Uh, earlier on, uh, they tended to be part of Columbia families. Um, so that's, that's, that's a difference as well. Faculty, um, there's a certain expectation of publishing more now, uh, which I think by and large has uh, been a positive both in that regard and in the liveliness of teaching on the part of senior faculty. Um, but I wouldn't think the changes there have been uh, anything more than incremental. So that's a, that's a quick overview of who, who's running the store. Uh, <laughs> from the outset, it was uh, at, the, at the head of the college was always a woman, which again, distinguishes Barnett from even most of the seven sisters. Uh, the administration has become increasingly uh, an administration uh, led by, by women. But again, I think that's been fairly incremental um, and non-disruptive -dis in, in any sense. So that's a quick run. Could you give a chronology of the major, uh, major turning points or events for the college since? Yeah, um, Virginia's Gildersleeve coming and going and, and, and with a considerable space in, in between. Uh, I think her, her coming in 1911 really represented a, a stabilizing of what had become a very unstable Barnard Columbia relationship. Um, it remained stable throughout her 36 years as, as Dean um, through a combination of at least public deference to Columbia and some pretty effective politicking on her part. Uh, to keep Barnard in the hunt with the other schools. Uh, she was able to put 
adequate pressure, for example, on the medical school to admit, begin to admit women during the First World War uh, was effective in the 1920s in getting the law school to do much the same thing. So she, a woman of, of real abilities and considerable accomplishments who probably stayed on too long um, so that her departure becomes an important break point. Mm. And then a, a calculated shift, I think, on the part of the trustees to come up with a different, uh, different kind of, of leader of a women's college. Uh, Gillisleeve remained single throughout her, throughout her life. Um, and she was succeeded by the uh, mother of five children, a um, uh, runner of a major family in the city and somebody who I think looked after students with a certain degree of almost maternal care uh, that was notably absent from uh, Gildersleeve's treatment of uh, Barnard students. It was a kind of sink or swim uh, mentality that I think she espoused. And she had, uh, it would appear talking with trustees who, went back to that period, either talking to them directly or in some cases, some of their memoirs, um, was uh, could be a little rough with uh, rough students. That is, those who were not uh, academically prepared in, in socially circumstances. Uh, Macintosh, I think, welcomes the diversity that, uh, that Gildersleeve had at best tolerated in the, in the student party and um, came to be seen, I think, by students as a great success. Faculty, uh, strangely, I think, didn't warm to her as, as much, or certainly the, the older faculty who had acclimatized themselves to Gildersleeve often thought that Millicent had uh, had become too much of a schoolmistress in her years at Greeley, and that her academic credentials, which I think were very respectable, PhD from Johns Hopkins, uh, went, was not quite up to snuff. So um, it, it would depend on who you look to to assess her presidency. Uh, and then finally, I think in this trajectory, um, Ellen Farrer's presidency in the 1980s, uh, taking the college from almost a psychological point of bankruptcy uh, to say nothing of the financial stress of the period. And over the course of 13 years, putting it in the kind of shape that both Judith Shapiro and, and Deborah Spar could, could take further along. Um, those are big moments. Uh, so that, that's a kind of top down view of what I actually think in uh, academic history, uh, presidents, deans still matter. And uh, at a small place like Barnard, where a lot of the day-to-day -day activity involves dealing you know, with the big guys across the street, uh, uh, a certain kind of political savvy is pretty essential, I think, to you know, keeping the store going. And we've been lucky, I think, in that, in that regard. You, Bob, you arrived at Barnard in the late 60s? Yes, the year after uh, 68. I okay. came in the, in the fall of 69. So um, can you describe a little bit? The, the chapter yeah. in the book was very interesting about uh, Barnard's yeah. role and all that. Yeah, because I was coming, I was coming from Harvard, and Harvard had had a little mm, perturbation in the spring of '69. But it was perfectly clear to me, particularly because I knew a lot of Columbia College students who were in the graduate program at Harvard, who were watching this very closely. What was going on at Columbia? But Columbia's was a bigger deal, um, and it turned out to be obvious once once I was here. Um, relationships at Barnard were strained, uh, but relationships across the street at Columbia, which I was interested in, in trying to figure out and making my way, um, there were departments in which 
those who had sided, so they were described with the students and those who had sided with the administration were no longer talking to each other, would not serve together on PhD committees. Um, you know, it, it, and the knives were out. And it was also the case, again, in a, in a muted way at Barnard. Barnard always seemed to me to be able to do some of the things Columbia was doing without quite the level of animosity that got generated. Um, but the financial exigencies of, of Columbia in the 70s were, were, were more serious than they were at Barnard. And they got handled in a very rough, you know, uh, down the hallway kind of, you know, beg thy neighbor situation. And uh, again, those of us who were at, at Barnard but had some insight into what was going on at Columbia often found ourselves <laughs> rather, rather pleased that we had at least under, you know, the cover of civility still was there at, at, at Barnard. And it, had been pretty well torn up at, at Columbia. And it was, part of, it was part of bringing the place back together. Uh, Martha Peterson was an, was an effective uh, negotiator in a kind of Midwest Oshuck sort of way. Uh, McGill, on the other hand, I thought of myself, I think, as a state trooper and would you know, put, put on the aviator classes and, and have at it. And whether he was dealing with his own deans or somebody coming from across the street. And of course, one of the people for whom that occurred was Jacqueline Mashfeld, who succeeded a politically savvy Peterson and did have some pretty, I think, some pretty straight marching orders from her trustees to be to be careful of what Columbia was up to. And, and the, those were perfectly appropriate because there were people who were operating on that side of Broadway with the assumption that within three, maybe four at the most, five years, Barnard would be folded into Columbia. And under those terms, there's nothing that goes on at Barnard that's not of interest to Columbia because they, you know, we're soon going to have to, to take, take it over. Uh, that was that was troublesome, and um, uh, it was not, I think, until late in the Futter administration, about the time I became not that I not that I helped resolve the issues, but about the time I became dean, uh, things were starting to loosen up, and Barnard had figured out again prior to my having any say in the administration how to make themselves useful to Columbia, which I think has gone on to this day in, in an increasing way. So that if, if, if Barnard for some reason went away, it would have a dramatic impact on Columbia. And there's a recognition of it. I mean, I think it would have had a dramatic impact at any time, but the recognition also leads to a kind of, uh, willingness to, to acknowledge the, the, the contributions of, of Barnard and to make use of Barnard resources, including its faculty. Um, that's good and better, to, better than the good old days. Interesting. <clears throat> so your book kind of ends really with, the, with Deborah Sparr's presidency. Right. It's a nice picture of Sion, but how would you, in the context of everything you know about the Columbia relationship, how would you describe the evolution of the relationship in the last two decades? Uh, 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 one of convergence um, that I think, uh, again, and I've been working on the Columbia history in the, during the Bollinger presidency lately, so I'm kind of it's coming out of my ears. Uh, a, a recognition on the part of Columbia uh, that undergraduate teaching is an important part of what Columbia University does has had an impact both on Columbia's view of Barnard, because we do that very well, and also of Columbia's view of what are the 
the bare necessities of a tenure nomination on the Columbia side. Far many more Columbia faculty teach undergraduates today. They teach fewer courses than 30 years ago, but a higher percentage of those courses are, in, are engaging undergraduates. And so there's a, there's a commonality of experience because the difference used to be, with the exception of 10 or 12 Barnard faculty, uh, all the rest taught exclusively undergraduates and the powers that be in the academic departments, your department, economics, the history department, those people were almost always able to fashion their, act, their teaching programs so that they were almost exclusively graduate students. So this sort of recentering of Columbia College within Columbia makes what Barnard does and does it well uh, seem more important, I think, to Columbia than it did in the past. Uh, also, uh, Columbia's finances are in much better shape than they used to be. So they are less inclined to be looking around to pick up nickels and dimes. Um, and, and in the 1970s, uh, Barnard represented more than nickels or dimes to them. Um, because uh, the, there weren't all that many income streams. And Barnard in the 1970s managed to balance its books, um, managed to pay its salary to faculty on a pretty regular basis. Um, and there was some thought that uh, if you took over one of these uh, efficiently operating enterprises, that Columbia would be better for the arrangement. Now it's got, big things to do. Uh, it's, got, it's got Manhattanville to fill up. Um, it's dealing with the fact that it's rejecting 15 or every 16 students that apply. Um, so, you know, why, why give Barnard a tough time when Barnard is financially okay, uh, academically superb, uh, is becoming like Columbia, even more competitive every year in terms of admissions. Uh, what's not to like? And I think that's that's what I'm I'm sure that on a day to day basis, particularly in your office, uh, in dealing with your counterparts, there are points of, of friction, and I can't compare them with my own period. But uh, I would bet that there was still there was still more rough edges in the late 80s uh, around tenure matters particularly, but also who gets to, to take the lead in what kinds of programs. And, and Barnard has, I think, been quite successful in pointing out and then maintaining that we were there first with women's studies or we were there first with environmental studies. And okay, we're, we still wanna be in the, in the game. And, by and large, it seems to me that Columbia has welcomed those kinds of initiatives. It's a big place. It can't move as quickly or as nimbly as Barnard has. So that's a good news story, but I'm sure there's, you know, there's some undercurrents uh, because uh, just out of original sin, something has to be still <laughs> going wrong. Um, you know, the, the, the last, uh, the crisis, the COVID crisis, the pandemic, definitely brought, I think, in in real ways, the Barnard and the university closer together. Uh, we really cooperated a great deal, shared information, you know, worked on curricular initiatives together and things like that. And Barnard led to a certain degree, to your point, Bob, it's more nimble, it's faster, it's easier to react, it's easier to push the faculty um, as a faculty, as a united body. Yeah, so, I think that's true. <clears throat> um, and I think uh, it it used to be true under duress. Uh, we better we better hang together, yeah. <laughs> uh, and and I think it then becomes it becomes somewhat internalized uh, in, within the departments, and so, but also it's taking signals I think from the leadership that um, cooperation is uh, in everybody's interest, and we're pretty good at it. I mean, we don't get taken to the cleaners. And if you can maintain that with a uh, uh, you know, hundred pound gorilla, 
and that you're negotiating with, then, then that, that's, that's the way to, way to do it. So there's a question from um, one of our participants, which Good. is to just, it's, it's along the lines of what we've been talking about, but this, this question is, what, what is or are the single biggest contributions of Barnard to the larger university historically in your? Mm. Um, I think a capacity to rethink the uh, inherited curriculum would, would serve. Um, say an instance of American studies, it's now, a, it's now a significant program at Columbia, but American studies began at Barnard in the late 1930s. And um, when, you know, aside from, certainly Harvard didn't do much with it, even in my day in the late 60s. Um, so as a kind of regional studies program, but based uh, on, on this part of the world, that was an innovation. Medieval studies, same thing. Uh, uh, Columbia certainly had a wonderful collection of medievalists, but they were located in the English department or in the history department. And there was very little connection uh, between them. And this notion of silos, I think, applies here. And then more laterally, I think environmental studies, environmental science was something that the geology department and the biology department may have had individual specialists in, but did not offer anything like that for undergraduate study. Um, so I think we've continued to th theater. Um, art history, uh, world-class art history department at Columbia, um, but slower than Barnard in getting uh, into thinking of the visual arts and of uh, art as a, as a practice, not as an as a intellectual, uh, discipline. Uh, that I think has been uh, a long term and, and probably can continue to be a, an important contribution that Barnard makes. Uh, so some more questions from yeah. our audience, Bob. Yeah, good. Um, how do you think Barnard undergraduates and Columbia undergraduate women are the same or different? Um, um, Oh, I think there is a difference because um, I, th I think it, it wasn't so clear in when the when this first began in the in the eighties uh, when a, a bright woman interested in coming to New York had two choices in, on Morningside Heights rather than just one, and I think it took a little while to sort out that what it was that prompted some of those women to think a barn rather than Columbia. Um, it was fairly obvious why they might think of Columbia rather than Barnard. And I think there was a little uh, lack of confidence on our part uh, as to the capacity of, or the willingness of 16, 17 year olds to begin thinking seriously of a woman's college in this day and age. And deciding that Barnard's peculiar arrangement, that it's cheek by jaw with, with Columbia, classes are integrated, it's in New York City, but it's an institution that focuses on the education of women and shows it in part with a faculty that has, since the 1920s, uh, had a majority of women as faculty members. And since at least the 1970s, a majority of the full of the senior faculty. So it's an institution that uh, has shown, I think, an interest in, in women that, it, that would be hard for a co-ed institution to do as strongly, witness a, a Cornell or even a University of Rochester that I was familiar with in the late 50s, 60s, uh, and almost impossible for and all guys uh, university for at least a generation after it ceases to be that. I mean, there's a kind of residual dimension to it. But I think that Columbia has about played through now. Um, and particularly, and I know because of the book I did on, on the engineering school that 
I, that book finished just as uh, Mary Boyce was becoming dean of the engineering school and in the same way that Sion was just becoming dean at Barnard when I finished college of her own. And uh, the fact that she's now the provost of the university uh, does suggest that maybe <laughs> Columbia has gotten through that patch, but, but Barnard has been pointing out how to do it for years and years. <laughs> Great. <clears throat> so um, a very pointed question, um, provocative question, and it, it, one of the one of the participants writes, I sometimes think that Laura Gill gets a bad rap. I admire independence from Nicholas Mur Murray Butler, um, even if it created problems. And she did get Brooks Hall built. Do you know if anyone supported her among the faculty or her peers at other institutions? Do you have any firsthand account of her personally? We know she went on to a successful administrative career elsewhere. But oh, that's that's a wonderful question, and I plead guilty to piling on to, <laughs> to poor, poor Miss Gill. Um, although, in my defense. I, I think I tried to find um, those who were supportive of her at the, at the time and came up pretty short. Um, she, she was not uh, all that popular with students, although she came on after Emily James Smith, who was a wonder. I mean, 28 or 29 years old and, and she took to students and she, uh, taught classics in a way that made everyone want to be a classics major. Uh, that was not that was not Gill's story. She'd come from the Red Cross during the Spanish American War, so she was in that sense she was a tough uh, lady. And and she came she came a cropper of Nicholas Murray Butler right from the beginning of her administration, and she lost support of the trustees at Barnard. So it was, I think the best that I could say in her, in her defense or positive is that the Barnard uh, period of which extended about six, seven years was a, was a tough patch in her career. Yeah, you're right, she, she did um, manage uh, to become a quite, successful academic administrator, I think down in Tennessee or Kentucky. Um, so that was, uh, that, that was an important uh, feature. And then what did her in, as far as I could tell, um, was that she not only was not a New Yorker, um, where I think the conditions were such that probably better that you would be or that you could fake it, mm -hmm. but she had no bones about <laughs> saying that she was not. And she's she very much like um, Martha Peterson, who tried much harder, I think, uh, to sort of acclimate her to New York, but admitted toward the end of her presidency, she's pretty tired of the whole thing. <laughs> and getting back to Wisconsin was, was an important situation. So I think Laura Gill grew up in Maine and went to Smith. Uh, so she had, you know, there was, there was not much of the you know, Lower East Side about her. And I think that was, and, and at the same time, she didn't qualify as a Knickerbocker. So she was, I was, she was a little out of, I don't know if out of her depth because she was, I had no reason to think she wasn't as smart as everybody else she was dealing with, but not effective. And I had to have, have somebody, uh, if I couldn't have a perfect run of uh, ideal deans running the operation. I mean, then we would be up there with the Blessed Trinity or something. So, <laughs> so Laura, Laura it did become my heavy end. For that, I apologize <laughs> to your question. <laughs> okay. Um, <clears throat> do you, I mean, you talk about the scholar teacher model throughout the book, yeah. as distinguishing Barnard faculty. And in your comments today, Bob, you talk about the increased emphasis of anything over time on scholarship. So one of the one of the questions from the group joining today is: Do you think there's at the same time the same emphasis on teaching and mentoring at Barnard? 
Uh, I, I, yes, I do, is the short answer. I think there's a positive connection between the two. Uh, I, I acknowledge that, uh, that everyone doesn't have an infinite amount of time and some time committed to scholarship is, uh, has to come from someplace else. Um, I'm not sure though that it is a zero sum relationship with teaching. Um, so that <laughs> it may come from neglecting your children or uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> having, having more than your share of tickets because you parked on the wrong side of the street. Uh, I mean, I think the, the, there are other places where that time, which I think has increased uh, of commitment to uh, commitment to scholarship. It also shows up, I think, in um, in the way we, in which we use our leaves, faculty uses our leaves. It's for doing, getting on with the next project, rather than uh, than earn, that well earned vacation in Europe, which used to be the situation with Barnard faculty after every seven years or so. Um, I, you know, I've I've also argued, uh, and at least it's held up in some quarters that once a faculty member reaches her his 40s or so, um, you have pretty well exhausted uh, much of what you've learned in graduate school, particularly if you're in a field that moves. Uh, now, history happens to be one of the slower moving fields. What I would think, for example, in your field, uh, Linda, uh, if you're not doing research, um, to be sure it's specialized and you're not staying up on all sides. So some, in, in some areas, you're going to still work off what you acquired in graduate school. But in, in enough areas, you're going to be right up there with the most recent literature on it. You're doing the numbers, you're, you're checking the archives. So that there's a kind of ongoing intellectual vitality that you can sustain through research that spills over into your teaching. Even if over time, your teaching becomes somewhat more specialized and less uh, comprehensive. It probably ought to be because again, you're, you're, you're running out. I mean, I, I was very good uh, having been trained by mostly Bernard Balin at Harvard. I was good for 15 years, I think, on what I took out of graduate school in teaching early American history. Um, it's much better taught by someone like Herb Sloan, who has stayed in the in the field now, and so I'm ending up teaching, or had been uh, smaller classes in in areas that that I I could feel I was still very much in the hunt, um, and I think that's happened with Barnett. Uh, I don't think we've cut back at all on assessing the importance of teaching in the tenure situation. It just becomes an hour. You got to do both. Um, and, and it's not enough to do either. And I think at one time it was enough at Columbia. If you really were a hotshot publisher, researcher, uh, and the teaching wasn't excruciatingly embarrassing, okay, you're in. Um, I don't think that's the case there now, but it was never, and, and I think even by the time, certainly not even, by the time I was dean, an excellent teacher, over the course of five or six years of assistant professorship would not any longer get you tenure. And I think that was right, because I think 25 years from that point of granting that person tenure, you've got to be uh, concerned about whether this, how much gas is still in the tank if it was only filled up at, uh, when you got your PhD. So I, it, it's, it's a tension between teaching and, and, and scholarship, but I think it also has its positive aspects. And that's what I bet on when, you know, in looking over tenure cases within my own department or at the time I had, I had your job. And I certainly have seen no diminution of that tendency. Uh, and, and it's one that, is reinforced by Columbia's expectations, which again can be uh, nerve wracking at times, but uh, generally have produced, I think, a, a stronger faculty that Columbia draws upon more than they do did uh, again when I was teaching. 
I agree. And it creates this singular aspect to Barnard as an institution, the fact that its faculty are tenured at both Barnard and at yeah. Columbia. So um, one of the things you said is, is very resonant, and you're an example of it, Bob, which is that while it's true that we expect a lot of faculty in the sense that we there there's the expectations around scholarship have increased and the expectations around teaching and men, mentorship haven't diminished it is it is a kind of false dichotomy to think of all those yeah. three things as separate and your own sort of research agenda around writing your writing this book around Bar, about barnard intersected with both your teaching and your mentoring yeah. students work with you on the project and that's not atypical for our faculty that's right and 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 it did turn out to be one of those things you know there were two two advantages to writing academic history i didn't have to move too far um you know because the archives are either now in milstein or or in butler library or in the engineering school and you could draw on undergraduates to um to work with you which was fun, it was cheap, uh, and you uh, you allowed yourself to think that they were benefiting from it educationally, as well as the fourteen dollars an hour or something that we were ponying up. Yeah, so that was that's been a good part of it. Yeah. So <clears throat> I'm going to read verbatim this question because it's a it's really a beautifully written question, and one of our participants writes at the end of your wonderful book. You notably make a point about the hollowing of the middle class and that the bipolar Barnard student body makes clear. <clears throat> as Barnard was started as an idea without an endowment, what do you think are the top three things the college can do to stay ahead of, of its much better endowed peers like Smith and Wellesley that can offer other things to middle class families? Ah. Uh -huh. Uh, it is a, it's a complicated with that question, <laughs> and, and I, once again, I've been exposed like the Laura Gill <laughs> uh, notion uh, that that I did lean into this issue uh, and did not really come up with any solid answer. Mm -hmm. I, commenting on um, a hollowing out in in the sense that Barnard now has, when you compare it with. The other sisters, or with the other Ivies, or with Columbia, um, both a uh, high income tail and a uh, financially stressed tail in their distribution. Um, Barnett's median and family income, at least by the some recent studies, is you know, significantly higher than that of, of Smith or Wellesley, which I would not have expected. I was surprised by it. Um, at the same time, Barnard has uh, a substantial, comparatively speaking, a substantial number of kids who come uh, from low-income families. So, um, if if that's happening, then something has to be ha has to be space made in between. And I think that's that's probably true. And it's not a, a Barnard issue or a Barnard problem exclusively, but it is, I think, uh, it ought to be a concern for an institution that I think has had a important role in providing economic social mobility for um, tens of thousands of uh, families um, that a, a growing part of its student body uh, are already there. And in that sense, how many, how much room, how much can you do to keep um, this mobility that I think operated um, more effectively at in institutions of higher education earlier than it does now? I think Barnard recognizes that issue. And I think it's been particularly effective in providing at the margin um, services for those uh, students who come to Barnard uh, from families that are not able to, to help financially or even in terms of um, experiential help. This is the way I went, this is how I went to college. Well, if your parents didn't go to college, <laughs> there's not, not much help that's going to be coming from there. So I think, 
attentiveness to that, that tale of the distribution. Um, and probably at some stage, some concern about the, the advantages that don't turn on intellectual capacity or academic ability, the advantages that accrue to, to folks who come from wealthy neighborhoods with good, well-resourced schools uh, and have access to uh, tutoring and, and college preparation kinds of activities. I don't know how you how, how an admissions process would filter out that, uh, but there are, I think, lots of, I, I see them out here in the eastern end of Long Island at the three public schools that have some dealings with. Um, there are lots of kids, I think, who would benefit immensely from going to Barnard and for whom Barnard would find um, helpful to it as an institution who have no real uh, exposure to that, you know, to those opportunities because the, in, you know, the guidance counselor is, is overworked and can't spend much time with the, you know, with the, some of the, even some of their best students. So that's a problem. But again, it seems to me that Barnard has traditionally been pretty, and certainly since the 70s, uh, sensitive to these issues. And the pride I think it rightfully takes in having been an engine of social mobility for women, but also for families, um, will keep it alert to the, uh, what I'm calling in looking at Columbia, which is in the same situation, it's it's the coping with success. I mean, if you if you can reject um, eight out of nine uh, applicants, uh, you get to pick pretty much the class you want, and so it becomes, I think, somewhat incumbent upon the institution to be alert to some of these class differentials that Barnett didn't create that used to, I think. Uh, be quite effective in ameliorating, but sometimes can be seen as, if not part of the problem, not as obviously part of the solution. So if there's a downbeat notion to my book, it, it turns on, on those kinds of reflections about uh, what's happening to, to higher education and more broadly what's happening to the society. But, um, no. Yeah. You're, you're, leaving, you're leaving challenges for a future administration. That's right. That's all, so, yeah, 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 which is a good thing. It would be unfair to, you know, those who succeed, right. you got it right. all wrapped up. <laughs> exactly. So I just, Bob, I want to thank you. Time is, uh, is thin, unfortunately. I'm going to turn it back to Tony in a minute, but to, to offer conclusions. But I do want to thank you for not just this really brilliant book, but really half a century of commitment, hard work, real value to this wonderful college that we share. And um, we are deeply grateful for everything you've done for the college. I mean, your varied many roles, including the several few years we had to interact together Our, on, on various committees. So thank you, Bob, for that. Good times, and I thank you for saying. Sure. I'm gonna turn it over to Tony. Uh, who will come back and offer some concluding remarks. Thank you all for being part of this. Let me just repeat or uh, reinforce what Linda's just said. This was great. And Professor McKay has been a, a major marvelous aspect of the Barnard life for all these years. Thank you. Provost Bell and Professor Mackay for sharing your insights and being with us today. I think I'm speaking for everyone who would say they wish we could go on for longer. Thank you again to our guests for joining us. We hope you'll join us for more events of this reunion reimagined. And please visit reunion.barnard.edu to learn about other upcoming programs, mostly today. Thank you very much.